Hi, I'm Jess Fields. Welcome to the show. If you're watching on YouTube, sorry, I'm kind of in a weird part of the office. I'm moving everything over to my desk so I can use a better camera, have better quality for future episodes of these interviews. But anyway, I interviewed a guy named Mark Levin about criminal justice reform. Levin is the chief of policy and innovation at something called the Right on Crime Initiative, which is a project of the right-wing think tank, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, based in Austin, Texas. But Right on Crime has a national presence, and in fact, Levin has met with both Presidents Barack Obama and President Donald Trump about criminal justice reform, numerous times, in fact. He talked with me at length about the varying studies and research and the varying issues around criminal justice in terms of both racial disparities and what happened with George Floyd in these kinds of situations and what happens when a black man is arrested versus a white man and also just how criminal justice reform can proceed forward in the light of all the varying disparities that actually do exist. And uh, by the way, I'm just going to say, if you are unsure whether or not there are racial disparities in criminal justice, I think if you watch or listen to this interview with Levin, who again, comes from a conservative perspective, I think you will be quite enlightened to find out that yes, there are many disparities in criminal justice today. And there are many things in the system that simply seem to bias against maybe lower income people or people who are uh, people of color. For example, bail schedules, which actually set a certain amount of bail for each kind of crime. And therefore, if you get arrested and you have the means to go out and uh, make bail or hire a bail bondsman and get a, uh, a bail bond to go out and you know live your life for a few months while the court is getting its stuff together, well, then you can do that. But if you don't have the means, then you're stuck in prison and your life basically grinds to a halt for several months. That's just one example, although a very egregious one, of what happens in our current criminal justice system. And Levin provides a perspective on this, which, again, he comes from a certain side, but actually it's a pretty nonpartisan look at the research and all the things around this issue. So I think you will, regardless of where you come from, very much enjoy this extended interview with Mark Levin, the Chief of Policy and Innovation at the Right on Crime Initiative. Joining me now is Mark Levin. He is the Chief of Policy and Innovation for Right on Crime, which is a initiative of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, a think tank based in Austin, Texas. Mark, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So Mark, uh, how did you get to where you were working on criminal justice reform? Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Well, I'm an attorney and I was a, a staff attorney at the Texas Supreme Court, clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and was practicing law. And then uh, Brooke Rollins, who is now the domestic policy advisor for the President of the United States, along with Tim Dunn, who's vice chair of our board and was on our board at the time, came to me and said, you know, why would you like to come over to this small thing, tank five people at the time, and start a criminal justice program? And um, this kind of the motivation for that was Texas had been spending all this money building more and more prisons and not really getting a commensurate return on that investment when it comes to public safety. And also from a biblical perspective, frankly, we're not a religious organization, but a redemption perspective that uh, people uh, should be given a second chance consistent with public safety. And also that we weren't really serving victims of crime. They weren't getting restitution yet individuals were paying lots of money and fines and fees to the government. So the system was serving the government more than the people. So to be clear, um, you're coming from a conservative perspective. The Texas Public Policy Foundation is a, a right wing or a conservative think tank. And so you joined in, in 2005 and Rick Perry was governor. Um, tell a little bit about what was going on in Texas at the time with criminal justice, was there criminal justice reform? What was kind of the, the arc of that over the 10 to 15 years prior to your joining the organization? Yes, well, basically, uh, if you look historically from the early uh, or mid 70s to the mid 2000s nationally and in Texas, there was more than a five fold increase in, in incarceration rates. Um, and of course, spending ballooned on 
of corrections during that period as well. And really, when this all started back in the mid 70s, the US had a pretty similar incarceration rate as Europe. Uh, now, of course, we have 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners. Um, we have, in the last several years, as I'm sure we'll get into, seen a very slight decline in incarceration, um, but still a turning of the tide. But when, we, um, when I started in 2005, um, I began by really looking at the data. Who was going into prison in Texas? Um, how long were they staying? What programs were there? Were they working? Were those programs working to reduce recidivism, to get people employed uh, coming out of prison and so forth? And uh, what really happened, the turning point, was in January of 2007, there was a projection by the Legislative Budget Board that Texas would have to add another 17,000 prison beds, which would cost billions of dollars to build and operate over the next five years if we didn't change anything in terms of policy. And uh, that's basically a function of more people being sentenced to prison, people serving longer, high recidivism rates, people coming back. And so uh, what we really decided to do was sit down with people like Jerry Madden, who was chairman of the House Corrections Committee at the time, now a senior fellow with us, and say, what could we do differently that would both benefit public safety and take less of a toll on Texas taxpayers? And what we found was, is we talked to judges and prosecutors, they were saying, we're sending all these nonviolent individuals, low-level drug offenders, for example, we're sending them to prison because there's nowhere else to put them. The probation caseloads are huge, 150 people for one officer. There's no there's waiting list to get into a drug court. So there's waiting lists for mental health treatment for hundreds of days in many cases. And then at the back end of the system, there were people sitting in prison approved for parole they couldn't get into a treatment program that was a condition of actually being released, even though they had been approved for parole, thousands of people. So it was a backlog. And basically, we were starving the front end of the system in terms of alternatives to prison, probation, drug courts, ways to hold people accountable without sending them to prison. And we were actually starving the prison programming system in the prisons. And as a result, we were having this tremendous um, continued increase in costs. So really, it sounds like um, uh, the initial impetus for maybe shifting towards reform as opposed to taking a tougher on crime perspective that it really was the norm and in many places still is the norm in the United States for a long time. But the initial impetus was a cost impetus? Well, that's a great question because in 2007, Texas had a $6 billion surplus, budget surplus. And the biggest problem was actually we didn't have enough prison guards. We were thousands of prison guards short. So you have one person at the back door instead of two, very dangerous situation. Um, so when the economy's good, it's very hard to find people to work in prison, uh, especially those in Texas. They aren't air conditioned, it's a rough environment. Um, and um, so, but Speaker Tom Craddock, as you know, was a strong fiscal conservative. And when he appointed Jerry Madden, chairman of the Corrections Committee, he said, Jerry, don't build more prisons. They cost too much. And, and Jerry, by the way, says that was the most important words ever said to him, besides I do, by his late wife of 50 years uh, more. Um, so it, and, and so I don't know why Speaker Craddock said that. I think as a fiscal conservative, he believed, even though the money was there to build those prisons at the time, that you've got to sustain that. Now, he probably didn't have a crystal ball that we would have a huge downturn in 2008. Um, but yeah, that's how it happened. Well, let's take a pause in and just kind of recap this, because I think this is important for uh, many people that listen to this or not in Texas, but um, you certainly have kind of an arc here. So Texas had taken for many, many years, for decades, uh, really a, a tougher on crime perspective. And it was kind of the norm for candidates, um, really from both parties, but you know, since the mid 90s, Texas was trending in the direction of being controlled by Republicans. And prior to that, it was moderate and conservative Democrats who ran the state of Texas. And so all of these folks had said they were tougher on crime. Former Governor George W. Bush, tougher on crime. Uh, Governor Rick Perry, at the time he got elected, I think he probably took a tougher on crime perspective. But then as you get into when you joined the foundation, you're saying that these more conservative Republicans who ran the state started to take a slightly different approach. So uh, obviously all of this, Mark, we'll get to the racial justice issues and the current thing with uh, the aftermath of the George Floyd situation. But 
I want to I want to just kind of expound on this and, and elaborate on this because I think this is important. If a conservative state like Texas can do this, presumably, uh, then these kinds of reforms can can probably be done in other places. So in 2007, you you have this situation. The legislature decides to start changing its tune on building additional capacity in and investing more in prison. So then what happened at that point? What were the reforms that started to unfold? And what did the next you know period of time look like with regards to uh, criminal justice in Texas? Yes. And so one of the other things that's very important to note since we began down this path, our crime rate is down more than 30 percent. Our incarceration rate is down over 25 percent. So it has paid off. Obviously, there's many factors that impact those um, variables. But the, um, the, of course, the other thing that's really important to point out is, and you kind of alluded to this, Ann Richards built a lot of prisons. She also expanded substance abuse treatment. But George W. Bush then outdid her. But Mario Cuomo, Michael Dukakis, these people built tons of prisons. Everybody was doing it. So it was very much a bipartisan. And of course, this has come up in the context of the 1994 crime bill that even Bernie Sanders voted for. So, um, you know, it, uh, it's a, but it's a bipartisan effort to kind of rein in the excesses of this to say the pendulum went too far. Everyone was in favor of additional prisons in the 1990s, basically. Right. And part of the reason for that was crime had been going up for a number of years. Of course, it started going down in the mid-90s, but uh, it had been going up a lot since kind of really the, the late 60s when there was a feel-good mentality, if it feels good, do it, right? Uh, the idea that maybe society's responsible for people's criminal activity, not themselves. Really a false dichotomy, by the way, because how somebody's raised, for example, if you're exposed to violence, if you don't have a father inside the home, that's going to make it much more likely that you will commit crime, but that does not mean people shouldn't be held personally responsible. So anyway, but these are all really important factors, but I will tell you, we, to answer your question, we were, we've been able to sustain this um, and actually build on, on those reforms. So for example, um, we instituted uh, several years ago um, a program where people in state jail could earn time off their sentence by completing programs. Uh, likewise, people on probation uh, by being exemplary um, in terms of you know, certain benchmarks, getting a degree, um, getting an occupational credential, they could earn time off their probation, of course, not having any violation. So really, when you think about it, you want a system that rewards success, that creates the incentives, that makes the path to be law-abiding more attractive, even as we, of course, want to disincentivize people from breaking the law. Right. But where did the reforms, I guess, start? So um, I think what is, what is interesting here is you have a state that you know, I think most people around the country would recognize Texas as a right-wing controlled, a Republican controlled state. And yet in this period of time you're describing, Texas took a very drastic turn on criminal justice reform. And I mentioned former Governor Rick Perry, um, who ran for president and then served later in the, uh, the administration, uh, the Trump administration. Um, but, but former Governor Rick Perry also, I think, had a a change of heart on criminal justice reform. What were those initial reforms moving down the road of reform, I guess, criminal justice reform, as opposed to the tougher on crime stance? What, what did it start out as? What were those policies actually at that time? Yeah, so in 2007, the biggest change was in the budget to say, we're going to, uh, instead of spending billions to build more prisons, we put 241 million into drug courts, uh, mental health treatment, uh, probation, and then inside the prisons into these treatment programs that someone has to complete even after being approved for parole. We also, by the way, put money into subsidized halfway houses. There were hundreds of people ready to be released, having been granted parole, having completed those programs, but they didn't have a valid home plan. So they were stacking up in prison at a huge cost because there were waiting lists for a subsidized halfway house bed. So we did all that. We cleared out those bottlenecks. Now, in, in subsequent years, uh, we've addressed a number of other issues, record sealing, for example, for people that have a nonviolent, single nonviolent misdemeanor to get their record sealed so they can better find a job and a place to live. Um, so uh, we haven't rested on our laurels. We, we also raised the property offense threshold, how much you have to steal to be a felony uh, to adjust for inflation. Um, so that makes a huge difference as well. Um, so you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a variety of different, one of the other ones that's really important to this very timely is Rick Perry, where we worked with him in 2007, actually was, I believe as well, to sign the Sight and Summons Law. Now this basically said for small amounts of marijuana uh, or uh, driving with a suspended license, 
the officer would have the discretion to, instead of arresting you, to give you a citation and notice to appear. Of course, lo and behold, now we're in a time when officers are not only subject to other risks, but also to, to getting a virus. So this has really had renewed interest. Yeah, I mean, so let's kind of jump into, um, well, I want to I want to talk about that issue specifically drugs because that is so much of the of the prison population but before that why do you think former governor perry changed his tune on criminal justice well um you obviously you probably have to ask him um but i think that um many folks including of course our former president brooke rollins um had a chance to visit with him over it, as did Chairman John Whitmire, who's still the Senate Criminal Justice Chairman, Jerry Mack, and they worked so close together, they went to Governor Perry and made the case. Um, but I also think Governor Perry has an amazing heart for these issues. Of course, as you would know, many years later, he came in contact with what I believe was a wrongful prosecution, um, a frivolous prosecution. And so he's also now very interested in, for example, grand jury reform, which is an issue we're working on now in Texas. Well, could you describe, I'm sorry, could you describe the process, the fri what you describe as a frivolous prosecution? Could you, could you elaborate on that for people that do not know? Sure. So the Travis County uh, District Attorney at the time, Travis County's Austin, uh, some people say it's the blue dot in the red soup. Is that correct? Um, so, but Rosemary Lemberg, the Travis County District Attorney at the time, uh, was arrested for DWI. And at, during the video of that arrest, she was seen asking for special treatment, basically. She said, don't you know who I am and all of that. So Governor Perry, she refused to resign. Governor Perry eventually threatened to veto funding for the Public Integrity Unit, which for whatever reason at the time, uh, the authority to prosecute all statewide officials was vested with Travis County. Now, Governor Perry, even though Governor has the undisputed constitutional authority to line out a veto, but for simply threatening that, he was um, investigated um, uh, and uh, indicted. Um, actually, no, the indictment, the, the jury, jury, I believe, refused to indict him. Oh, no, he was indicted. And then he prevailed. I mean, it's been so long. But, you know, the, what Governor Perry is so concerned with is he cannot find out, um, not, nobody can find out what was said in a grand jury proceeding. There's no transcript in Texas, unlike the federal system. There's no um, way to ensure that the prosecutors presented any exculpatory evidence. Our legislation would say they have the uh, duty to do that. You, um, you can step outside to talk with your lawyer, but you can't have your lawyer inside, which is another issue we're trying to correct. So it's a really stacked deck. And you know the phrase, uh, Jess, you can indict a ham sandwich. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that. Yes, and and but I, I as far as though, um, I mean, you, you mentioned so you mentioned Jerry Madden, who you said works with you, Republican, yeah. John Whitmire, he's a Democrat from Austin, the state senator, of course, Governor Perry, a Republican, and then the Texas Public Policy Foundation is a, a conservative think tank, a right wing think tank. It is fair to say that in a lot of respects, what you're doing is kind of a bipartisan thing. I mean, you actually have met with both President Obama and President Trump, I think. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. How did that happen? Well, yeah, the meeting with President Obama, uh, and I, I do still have a picture of that um, on my wall, but it, uh, it was, I, got, I don't, it was, you know, in the last two years of his term, and um, as, as you may remember, President Obama really didn't start addressing criminal justice reform until his last two years. Um, but he had in that meeting, most of the people, you know, they were heads of police groups, mostly, you know, Democrats and so forth, um, head of the NAACP, uh, Kamala Harris was there. Um, but um, I, I was very impressed, I have to say, um, despite obviously disagreeing with President Obama on other policy matter, he gave everyone a chance to speak. He was um, just um, really wanted to listen. Um, and um, uh, so, Obviously, when I got the call saying, do you want to come to the White House? I, I, I remember I was, I was in an HEB, but I'm like, no matter who's president, I want to go and share our perspective. Um, and then later, I would be started going to the White House, probably went about six times starting in October 2017, meetings mostly with Jared Kushner uh, to discuss the first step that would be later, you know, evolved into being the first step back. But in the initial discussions were really about uh, reentry. How do we reduce the risk that people coming out of prison will go back to crime and increase the chance they'll get a job. Um, and um, 
I think we made some headway on that. Yeah. So you mentioned, I mean, uh, you, you alluded earlier to, uh, to Brooke Rollins, who is, uh, um, I guess, the advisor of domestic policy to the president, uh, but was the head of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. So there are several individuals, I think, from TPPF that are in the administration. Um, and obviously, the president has taken some um, significant steps on criminal justice reform. Could you talk a little bit about how that played out? And there was a major law that passed and just kind of describe what that law covered and, and all, all that, that story behind that. Yeah. And so, I mean, one of the things that was important was at the time these discussions began in late 2017, um, Jeff Sessions was the attorney general of the United States. Um, Jeff Sessions, um, to his credit, was a, a supporter of the Second Chance Act, which dealt with reentry that President George W. Bush initiated. Um, but he was not a supporter, to put it mildly, of changing sentencing laws, for example, federal drug sentencing laws, which are incredibly punitive. Decades so Attorney General Sessions would have been seen, he would have been like a tough on crime kind of guy. Is that fair? Yes, you could say that. And, and you know, I mean, he wouldn't deny it if he was talking to you. Um, but uh, so we, that was one of the reasons we started with this focus on reentry, because even people like former Attorney General Sessions, it brings everyone together. Um, as we all know, 700,000 people are going to get out of prison every year. Why don't we do something to make it less likely they're going to harm someone? So, so, re, so reentry, and I'm sorry, I just want to make sure everything that you say is kind of clarified and, and that we understand it. So reentry really is when you have people getting out of prison, then they go back into society. That's what reentry is talking about. Right, and not to mention even more people out of county jails, right? I mean, they're mostly not there that long, but also a major issue. Um, but um, yes, the idea is even things like a photo ID. People in so many places don't get a, a photo ID that they could use to get a job. So at the most basic level, it's a matter of putting someone in a position to be successful when they come out. So then what were the reforms that, um, that ended up passing under... Uh, and with the support of the Trump administration that, uh, that, that you were supportive of and working on with, with the White House? Right. So it, the first step back really began as a, um, well, even before that, let me say an initiative that we have now, Safe Streets and Second Chances, which is focused on people coming out of prison. And we, it's in partnership with Coke Industries and Florida State University. But that came out of those conversations with Jared. And during that, I and others said, um, I said, why, why don't we have everyone who comes into prison shortly after they get there, shouldn't they have an individualized reentry plan that says, what's our goal for this person when they're ultimately released? And how do we work towards that while they're in prison, like getting an occupational certification so they're a welder when they leave? Who are the family members that they can keep in touch with while they're in prison so they'll be successful when they go out, because we know that's correlated with reducing recidivism. So that was really what we started on, and that led to the Safe Streets and Second Chances initiative um, that we're now in many states um, partnering with correctional agencies, kind of an inside-out model. You start working with someone while they're still incarcerated on um, educational, vocational, all of these issues, and then you, you have a seamless transition, a warm handoff when they're released. So, but then the second part was, obviously, what do we get through Congress? And that started out as what was referred to as a back-end bill in the House, which is basically earning time for completing programs, recidivism reduction programs, while you're in federal prison. And as I said earlier, Texas and many other states had already done this. We had been involved in much of that. So in so many ways, the federal uh, reforms built on what Texas principally, but also various other states had done. And it also, by the way, had an impact in terms of the people in Congress, because you had individuals like Tom Tillis from North Carolina, Doug Collins from Georgia, who were instrumental, and they had been part of these justice reinvestment reforms in their states, in Georgia and North Carolina, and been outspoken on it, and they saw that it worked. Now, once that bill um, came over to the Senate, there was a real effort that um, Senator um, Mike Lee, for example, really was at, at, uh, spearheaded, but also, to be fair, Senator Booker, um, Senator Durbin, um, uh, and, and others, um, Tim Scott, very many of all that, to add a sentencing reform uh, component to the First Step Act, which involved, as you alluded to earlier, drug sentencing reform. Um, you may know Alice Marie Johnson. I mean, she served, before President Trump commuted her sentence, 
23 years in federal prison for a first time drug offense. There are people that would have served life in federal prison for a repeat drug offense, but that law has now been changed because of the First Step Act. So the First Step Act um, reduced life sentences for some drug offenders to 25 years, is that correct? Still, yeah, yeah still a heck of a long time. And still a long time. No so, I mean, you know, and then, um, uh, and then some federal prisoners who were sentenced for crack cocaine offenses before August of 20, 2010, I guess, get the opportunity to petition for reduced penalty. So, I mean, these are, these are obviously some changes, and I'm sure there's some other changes, but, uh, but still, uh, Mark, isn't it fair to say that with, with drugs in the United States of America, if a person is arrested uh, a, a few times, uh, for drug possession or use or, or if they're charged with distribution, something like that, then, I mean, that's, they can really go to jail for a very long time. Yes, that's right. And the other part of it was the safety valve to give uh, federal judges some discretion in sentencing people for a somewhat shorter period to federal prison if they met certain criteria, not having a serious criminal history, not being a gang leader, so yeah. forth. Now, um, you know, so... Uh, and by the way, if you commit the same drug possession offense in state, most states, you'll have a much lesser penalty than if you happen to do it in a national park or an airport or something. Where yeah, so actually that was, so Mark, that was going to be my next question is where's the federal and state breakdown too? Because I mean, when does this become a federal offense versus a state offense, some of these drug, drug issues? Well, that's really important because even when you look beyond the drug possession, which is obviously where the strongest argument is, but even when you look to, you know, what's referred to as obviously drug dealing or distribution, what happened over the last couple decades was more and more street corner drug dealers became the subject of federal prosecutions instead of state and local. And I mean, anyone concerned with federalism should be very concerned about that. Prosecutors at uh, Department of Justice and federal resources are invaluable for dealing with drug smuggling, for dealing with drug lords, uh, El Chapo, anybody like that. But to take people just on a sidewalk, you know, in any city, with a small amount of drugs, and by the way, the academic research says the low, the people uh, at this lowest totem pole in these organizations, they, they make less than the minimum wage an hour. Which, by the way, we need to address why they're doing this to begin with. The the the, and a lot of it is people join gangs for uh, some sense of belonging um, or to protect themselves in certain places that are that are so dangerous. So my one of the most fundamental things is you know all. For example, Attorney General Sessions was taught, all he would talk about was putting this particular individual in federal prison, prosecuting this particular person, and that's important. But if we don't talk about changing the dynamics in some of these communities that lead people, young men in particular, to get involved in dealing drugs or doing drugs, then we're only addressing part of the problem. Well, and I mean, a young African-American kid in an urban area who tries to sell some drugs to make extra money because he thinks that's the only way he can make some extra money. I mean, that's not the same as El Chapo. How did that ever become a federal offense, Mark? I mean, there's no interstate thing with that. So where's the, how did that become a federal issue? Well, as you know, uh, there's a long line of Supreme Court decisions dealing with interstate commerce that basically say a farmer has a little hay or something, a piece of hay, and somehow that's connected to interstate commerce through an endless series of, um, you know, that someone theoretically could buy it in another state and all of that. So it's a it's the conservative originalists, you know, in the in area of jurisprudence, whether they're people like Justice Scalia or Justice Blake, Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, they reject this type of theory. But that has, um, you know, led to this. But it doesn't mean we have to do it just because some um, kind of uh, people who believe in the living constitution theory have said that this so, somehow. So this the idea, to, so to clarify though, the idea is that some kid sells weed on a corner and that affects interstate commerce, which means that federal federal agents can take that kid into custody and charge him in federal court, where he will probably not get maybe as much understanding or presumably the law would be tougher than it would be at the state or local level. Is that fair to say? That's exactly right. And it's on this basis that if you, if you kind of aggregate all of these little transactions, they affect the price across the country for those particular drugs. So it's a very um, attenuated and, argument, it, not and, what the founders intended with interstate it, commerce. Is it, is it fair to say, though, that the federal um, 
the federal hearing that somebody like this gets is going to be much tougher the federal sentencing than if that's at the state or local level too absolutely i mean in texas I, it's fair to say people most people without a serious criminal history for a low level even though a small low level dealing offense particularly in urban areas of texas they're going to get probation most likely but if they're sentenced so let's say i mean let's just take that example let's say you've got a young person of color in where I am, the Houston area, you know, Harris County gets, gets elected, uh, gets uh, um, uh, um, uh, selected as having a, a, a drug offense. At the local level, you're saying it might be maybe even probation. Well, what happens if he's arrested by federal agents? Just, just so happens to be. Yeah. Well, over 90% of federal defendants uh, that are sentenced or get sentenced to prison, very, very few people get probation in the federal system. And again, it goes back to these rigid sentencing guidelines. Um, and so, and even the safety valve in the first step back, there's a lot of criteria you have to meet. And then even with that, it's le a lower, a shorter prison sentence, not going to probation. So um, yeah, it's treated much differently. And again, the original model was, the, and that's how it was several decades ago, the federal drug offender was cartels. It was the right. high level. more like El Chapo or the mob or something, but now it's, it's these young people. So, I mean, and once a young person is sentenced by a, by, in the federal system, how does that affect them versus the state or local um, laws applying? I mean, is it worse to have a federal offense on your record? Surely it is. Well, and another effect is, um, and we tried to address this at the first step back because we said people should be as much as possible in a federal prison within 500 miles of their home. But the federal prison system is sprawling all over the country. So you get sent away somewhere that your family can't visit you. And then in terms of reentering, it's a big disadvantage when you're not, you know, we have in Texas, some programs like community corrections facilities that the probation departments run. You're on, it's a residential program, but you kind of graduate out of it and they find a job for you. I mean, that's community corrections. It's not sending somebody a thousand miles to a federal prison. A lot of places we can go from here, but I, I really want to keep on asking a little bit more about this drug issue. I mean, it, it seems that so many of the people that are sentenced in ways that, that many reasonable people would say, well, that seems excessive. A lot of those are drug offenses even at the state and local level. So could you describe a little bit, and of course those disproportionately impact people of color, which we're kind of where we're going with this conversation given where we are right now in our society. Could you describe a little bit about drug offenders in the criminal justice system, how they are affected by the laws we have, how you know that disproportionately affects people of color? I mean, how many people coming in, for example, are drug offenders versus you know, murderers or rapists or people that everybody can agree, okay, these folks need to go to prison. Right. Well, even here in Texas, with all the reforms we've done, there's about 15,000 people every year sentenced to prison or state jail for drug possession. So it's a, we're trying to address that hopefully next session. Well, hold on. So wait, 15,000 in Texas versus how many for like violent crimes and other things? There's a lot of different violent crimes and there's a lot of different property crimes. But one of the things I can tell you is since Texas started these reforms in 2007 that I talk about, we've gone from about 60-40 in terms of the on-hand prison population. It was 60-40 nonviolent, 60-40 uh, nonviolent, and now it's 60-40 violent. So a greater composition. Now, we, of course, we have much lower prison population. We're down to 135,000 versus 160 at the top. But also, we have a greater percentage of what's still there is people committed, convicted of a violent offense. So 40% nonviolent in Texas. Uh, right. Nationally, where does that sit? Well, in the federal system, you do have a different composition. You have, for example, more people convicted of financial crimes, insider trading and things like that. Uh, you have child pornography, which people will define in different ways. Um, obviously, very a serious matter. But I think that... Um, in, in general, in the federal system, you still also have, you know, a fair number of people involved in, you know, cross-border drug dealing. And again, they may be, um, unless they had some type of weapons offense, they will be classified as nonviolent. Um, 
So, um, but it, it is the, the, the different states, it really depends on their sentencing laws. Like Oregon has almost no people in prison for drug possession because that's how they've set things up. And of course, by the way, there's zero correlation between how many people a state has in prison for drug possession and how the levels of substance abuse in their population. And this- Hold on. Also goes to about- um, Wait, that's, wait this, so, so that's, that's an important point to reiterate. The level of people in prison for drug offenses has no bearing on the number of people using drugs out in the population. Right, and the Pew Center's put out research showing that. And the other point is, you mentioned um, the racial impact. You know, African Americans, whites, Hispanics, they all use drugs in the same levels. It's just that in poor communities, there's a lot more police in their area. And if they're less wealthy, they're more likely to not be able to get their drugs surreptitiously. So Hold like, on, Mark. Hold on. You cut out, and your, your connection is a little unstable, by the way. I don't know if you have something else running in the background, but I'm going to edit this little part of the interview out because you, you're definitely cutting out a little bit. So I'm going to give myself an audio marker there. It shows up as spikes on the audio, and then I'm going to edit that out. And then I'm just going to ask you the question. You can reiterate what you were just saying. And so, Mark, then what about the racial impact of these drug offenses and, and drug offenders being arrested? How, what's the racial impact? Well, it's really uh, young um, African-American men in particular, for example, because they're more likely to live in areas where there's more police. And because they don't have the resources to get their drugs surreptitiously, it's more likely to be an open, you know, on a street corner. They're more likely to get caught. So the research shows all races use drugs in the same amount. But there's a huge disproportionate um, share of arrests that are attributable to African Americans. Okay, so you mentioned a few reasons for that, but let's just kind of ex expand that a little bit. African Americans, you're saying, are more likely to live in areas with a high police presence. Does that mean areas of town that are a little bit lower income? Or what, what exactly does that mean, and how does that relate to this and being arrested more? Yes, and so this also will... Um, kind of relate to the uh, CompStat, the data-driven policing that New York City started under Mayor Giuliani. Um, now, it makes all the sense in the world to have police in the areas where there's the most violent crime, for example, and also where the most cars are broken into on the street because you want to deter that. And the, there's actually significant evidence that shows you can deter it with police visibility. But because police are there, they also find a lot of people with marijuana. They, they come across on the street. And of course, you know, with something like stop and frisk, that even increased it further. But so it's not necessarily that the intent was by that police department to have this racial impact, but undoubtedly it did. And um, so uh, it, we absolutely have to acknowledge that fact. Um, and we can account for it in terms of saying, we don't want to lock all these people up for small amounts of, of marijuana, or even with other drugs, we want to um, have things like drug courts and other programs, pre-arrest, pre uh, pre-trial diversion. So even that, um, you know, you don't even get a conviction that you, um, if you need drug treatment, you can get that. Um, and we don't give people the scarlet letter of a lifetime um, criminal record. Well, let me ask you that. That just kind of prompts a question. I mean, you're talking about drug treatment. I'm sure that some people would say, probably have said, well, isn't that more expensive than putting them in prison? I mean, is that true or, or is that not, not true? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, outpatient drug treatment is very much less expensive than putting people in prison. Um, and, you know, residential drug treatment, which most people don't need, but, but is necessary in certain cases, um, that does cost a lot of money. But it's a shorter period of time. You could actually do something with someone for six months that makes a difference, <laughs> that produces a positive outcome instead of warehousing them for five years. Um, so that's part of the way to look at it. And then medication-assisted treatment for opioids, for example, um, when used in conjunction with counseling, it's not a silver bullet alone, but uh, as part of a broader treatment intervention, uh, there have been very positive results. So financially, maybe is not not a, a big impact or maybe a better impact to, to go towards more treatment. And then so you mentioned something else, which was very interesting. You said that even though all races use drugs at the same level, that African-Americans have less resources to obtain their drugs surreptitiously. What do you mean by that? How, could you explain that? Because that's not something that just immediately comes to mind, but it kind of makes sense. But could you explain that a little bit? 
Well, I mean, basically, if you're getting your drugs on a street corner, you're more likely to get detected by the police. Or if you're smoking, you know, drugs in a park, right, a public park. But if you're wealthy and you can, whether through private planes or all sorts of, you know, things we probably don't even imagine, you can get your drugs uh, with much less chance of, you know, being detected. So is that like, I mean, um, I immediately think of um, uh, the guy that was arrested in California for running the online drug store with the Silk Road or something. So there's like more, maybe more Anglos use the something like the Silk Road to buy their drugs in the mail or something like that. Right. And I do think it's, you know, obviously economic based, perhaps, but there's an overlap, as we all know, in terms of economic um, people's uh, uh, wealth and income and race. Okay. So let's, so let's jump from that to some other issues, because really, it's not just drugs. Drugs are a huge, huge part of this. But it seems that for all offenses, um, people of color are disproportionately impacted. Why is that, Mark? And, and why is it that it seems to obviously many people on the streets now protesting that people of color get a really bad shake by a lot of different people in uh, police departments and, uh, and tend to be sentenced more than those who are Caucasian. What, what is that about? What is the numbers behind all of that? And what's the reasoning? Well, a lot of it does go back to the heightened police presence in um, certain neighborhoods. And again, that it really is largely well-intentioned and based on, you know, where high rates of violent crime or, or um, you know, uh, homes broken into, cars broken into, right? Um, but once you're there, you tend to find a lot of other things. And, um, but the other problem is the relationship, the lack of trust um, that particularly see. And there was a poll that came out, I think 30%, 36% of blacks say they trust the police. This was just released several days ago. And that's, that gives everybody a lot of heartburn. You know, one of the ways police solve violent crimes and property crime and serious crimes is with the help of the community, uh, with witnesses coming forward. And, and actually, a lot of victims never come forward because they don't want to, they don't trust the police. There was a study in Milwaukee that found after some high profile officer involved shootings of black men um, that um, the rate at which people reported serious crimes in these mostly African American neighborhoods went down significantly. Um, and so even if your main, your overriding concern and, and a, a huge, you know, a top thing for us is public safety, you want a strong uh, bond of trust between the community and the police. And that's why things like police training, uh, de-escalation tactics, these are so important. So why is it that um, African Americans do not trust the police? Well, I'm probably not, you know, the person best qualified to answer that question. But, um, well, I, uh, fair enough. I mean, you, you are obviously a Caucasian individual from a conservative think tank, it should be said. At the same time, you do study this every day and you look at the research. What does the, maybe I should ask, what does the research say? about why African-Americans and people of color do not trust the police? Well, let me put it this way. People might be surprised to know the most trusted brand in India is Colgate, Colgate toothpaste. When you squeeze, uh, and I'm not here to advertise for Colgate, when you squeeze a tube of Colgate, you know exactly what you're going to get every time. It's, there's none that are contaminated. It's the same product every time, Coca-Cola, right? Um, now, when police pull up behind you, I think for a lot of African-American men in particular, they don't know who's, they're gonna be seen. They don't, it's not, it's the, the mission of police is to protect and serve. So it should be the same product every time. Now, one of the biggest things I think we need to focus on is how to police speak to the people that they interact with in terms of communication, interpersonal skills. You know, there's something called procedural justice. And what that means is you explain to someone why you pulled them over, for example, and um, you try to find out um, some of what's going on with them and give them a chance to, to be heard as well. You know, I was actually pulled over twice going to hear Justice Scalia speak at Texas A&M. Um, and I told I still got a ticket on all of those, but I told him this is where I'm going. Um, but, you know, this really is about 
um, communicating with people in a way that basically just recognizes we all have the same value. Um, and even if you did something wrong, and even if I'm about to take you to jail, I'm going to tell you, you know, not in an intimidating way, but I'm going to tell you exactly why I'm doing this. Now, Sandra Bland in Texas, you know, this was the woman who was, um, if you look at that interaction, the video, the officer raised his voice. He inflamed the situation. He pulled her over for a broken taillight, and then um, she ended up killing herself uh, after being in jail. Um, and it's just a, a terrible thing if you watch that video to see that the officer escalated that interaction. Well, I mean, let's, let's go there, Mark. Um, African-Americans are pulled over at rates that far exceed those of whites. Isn't that true? It is. It is true. Um, and, what are the numbers on that? How, how much more are blacks pulled over than whites? Well, we could talk about Senator Tim Scott. He said he was pulled over seven times in, I guess, the course of a year or so by the Capitol Police. Um, Lindsey Graham said, I wasn't pulled over once. I'm also a senator from South Carolina. Well, that's, I mean, I, I've heard the term driving while black. That's a real thing. So why are African Americans pulled over at rates that are so high? Does that come down to racism in the police force? Does that come down to a lack of uh, checks and balances or something else? I mean, how do you stop that problem? Well, I, I think you have to look at why people are pulled over also to begin with. As I said, Sandra Bland was a broken taillight. We're trying to pass a law that says you can't be jailed, can't be taken to jail for fine only uh, traffic offenses in Texas, unless there's a breach of the peace or an imminent danger to the officer. I mean, people can't believe it when, and then we, this was in the Republican Party platform and the Democratic Party platform, by the way, still couldn't quite, quite get through last session in Texas because of the police officers union. But when you tell people that you could be taken to jail for a broken taillight or for an expired inspection sticker or um, failure to signal, people say, what? And then when you actually look at the data, to your point, Jess, over half of the people that are taken to jail for that are black in Texas. Yeah, but what's the, po okay, half of the people in Texas taken to jail for something like a broken taillight are black. What's the population of African Americans in Texas, Mark? About 15%. 15%. So three times their portion of the population, they're ta or over that, they're taken to jail for that. I mean, that, that, is, uh, that is astonishing. Well, and again, it doesn't prove that, you know, I mean, I think most police officers do a great job, and I don't think most police officers are harbor, you know, bigotry, right? But I think, first of all, we know African Americans, lower income, they're less likely to uh, be able to, uh, to have it. They're more likely to have an issue like a broken taillight. They're less likely to have auto insurance. So these, we've made, we've cast the net so wide that things that you could be brought to jail for, where even if all, every officer had perfect intentions, we would still have that. So, so what is the solution? Is it to narrow the net of things that you can be taken to jail for? Is it to somehow, I mean, that's not going to stop uh, people of color from being pulled over at higher rates than, than whites. I mean, where is the root of this problem? Well, but I think that's a, that is a place to start. I, I, it's not a panacea, but it's certainly the, the more things you can be arrested or taken to jail for, and even pulled over for to some degree, um, the more we allow um, these, and the more relationship those things have with people's socioeconomic status, we are particularly going to get these disproportionate results. Um, you know, it, it's a very difficult issue. I'll give you an example. There's research that shows in the area of juvenile justice that um, when you have um, uh, photos of uh, young black men, um, people tend to, as opposed to photos of men of other, young men of other races, people tend to say that um, person who's actually 15 or 16 or 13 or 12, they tend to say the black uh, boy is older than, he, uh, older than he actually is. So that um, comes up in different areas in terms of kids being certified to stand trial as adults, for example, and facing much heavier consequences. So it's um, obviously we, we get, do have to address the issue of unconscious bias, even though it may not be intentional. But how do you do it? I mean, it, it, I, I realize that there may not be an easy solution to it. I guess I want to understand why. Why is it that people of color are pulled over more? I mean, that seems like the beginning 
of the issue. Some of it may be explained, as you said, by the fact that people of color tend to live in areas with higher police presence, which some of that correlation is understandable. But I guess how do you reduce the, let's say, potentially inherent bias that any individual may have in, a ju in judging a situation? Uh, because as you mentioned, you know, photographs of young African-American teens, they're judged to be older. Well, that would presumably indicate that there is some inherent bias and that when a police officer who has a certain amount of discretion to use his or her authority is put in a position to use the authority and they say, well, who am I going to pull over today? They tend to pull over more African-Americans than whites. Is that about the police officer? Is it, I mean, it's not just about the net of crimes that you can be convicted for. I mean, maybe some of it is the taillight thing, but how do you address that? I mean, what, what is the, it, maybe there isn't a solution right now, Mark, but I, I guess I would love to know how do you start to address that? Because I think that is that sense. And the reason I'm, I'm harping on this a little bit, I want to understand it because I feel like that sense is at the very core of so much of what is going on right now in America with the protests. And when I spoke to Maya Santa Maria, who's a Latina in Minneapolis, a Latina business owner, her business was burned down actually as a result of the riots, but she felt like that there was a disproportionate racial impact from the local policing there. In she operated a business in Derek Chauvin's precinct. I mean, and obviously, you know, you don't hear a lot about, maybe it's happened, but you don't hear about, um, uh, and we'll probably get to this too, but you know, white people being knelt on, on their neck, you know, on the ground, this kind of thing. I guess, what, what is the root cause of this? Or how do you address that? Or maybe you can't, I don't know. Well, you know, it does obviously relate to the long history, you know, that we've had in this country and we've made tremendous progress, but we sure. have had obviously uh, generations that have been affected by the original sin of our country in terms of slavery and we're still making a more perfect union. Um, but, you know, I think the use of force obviously is a smart place to start because the consequences are so grave as, as we just saw. Um, and so um, I think having um, officers who, um, you know, have a mentality of, of de-escalating situations makes a huge difference. And we've actually done some research, my colleague, Randy Peterson, who's a career law enforcement officer, he's done some research showing the role of physical fitness, that officers that are in better shape are less likely to actually resort to, to deadly force um, or even excessive force or any force. Um, you know, and at the root of this, there's a phrase that I love, which is the law is the weakest form of social control. I mean, in anti interaction, just about any officer wants to go in with the notion, how do I get this person to comply? Whatever that looks like, you know, signing a citation um, or, you know, uh, getting in the via police cruiser and going to jail without having to resort to force. And, you know, that is the broader question for our whole society. In other words, how do we get people to follow the law, to follow social norms without having to resort to force? You know, we often say character is what you do when nobody's looking. Well, you know, normally for most people, it's self-restraint, it's family, it's community, it's churches. And so when all that kind of gets stripped away, we're just left with brute force, which is the police. And we're asking police to do a whole heck of a lot. And many of them, whether it's their training, their personality that wasn't suitable to be a police officer to begin with. And now I see Baltimore started last year doing screening for interpersonal skills and they're hiring. So we, we, we have to do a much better job in policing, but you're right, Jess, it's not just the police, it's our responsibility as a whole society. Well, I just don't understand, I'm just trying to get to the bottom of it. I, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm sure there's different perspectives on this, but to me, it seems that no one is, has found an answer to this. And that this is at the core of so many white people, thousands upon probably millions of people are protesting around the United States because of this, because there is a, there's a tilt. Some of it's explained by the inherent bias there, as you say, passed down from the original sin of slavery and, and racism in our country. That probably is a lot of it, but there is also a systemic problem and what exactly that is, I, I just, I want to know, but I, I feel like it's hard to figure that out. Let me ask you, you mentioned law is the weakest form of social control. Please explain that a little bit more. How do you, 
deal with, um, you know, how do you, how do you deal with trying to enact norms and trying to have um, uh, societal norms, let's say, enacted without having a law? I mean, I think most people naturally go to, well, you have to have a law for it. So what you say law is the weakest form of social control. Explain that. Well, how about the your laws? You know, the Ten Commandments, right? But we in Texas have over 3,000 criminal laws. And, and federally, they gave up after counting 4,500, the General Accounting Office, 40, over 4,500 federal criminal laws. Now, these are just statutes. Uh, former Attorney General Dick Thornburg under President Reagan said there's 300,000 criminal federal regulations. Um, you know, 300,000 federal criminal regulations? Right, right. So it, it's astounding. So we have all these laws because, you know, you've, we've all heard the phrase law and order. We got plenty of laws. <laughs> order, that we're not doing so good on. So, so it's just, like, so, so criminal laws at the federal level, I mean, it's probably some of this stuff is like some of this drug stuff, obviously murder, you know, the white collar crimes and things like that. And then it's probably stuff like what? Bringing papayas across, you know, the border or I mean, what, what, what? How do you have 300,000 criminal laws at the federal level? Yes. Well, and then in Texas, we have 11 felonies relating to harvesting oysters, uh, which is 11 astounding. felonies relating to oysters. Yes. I mean, it's just astounding. And uh, so, I mean, we've uh, it's a one way ratchet. In other words, we call them lawmakers. That's because they make laws. They don't repeal them. Now, by the way, do the uh, oysters have to press charges for any of those 11 offenses? <laughs> No, they have to do with like something, you know, trying to catch oysters at night. You know, it's really supposed to do it during the day, things like that. You're not allowed to catch oysters at night? Yes, that's right. So, I mean, the thing is, Minnesota actually, a few years ago, they had what was called an unsession. Instead of a legislative session, it was a legislative unsession. One day, where all they did was repeal these types of laws. Can you imagine that? You could just take out one day out of all the days we pass laws and get rid of some. So, uh, we have a, a, a problem of legitimacy because not everybody views all of these laws and or the police or our government is legitimate. So we have to correct that. But just passing more laws isn't the answer. We have tons of laws. Um, we have to uh, take the steps that will make it more likely uh, people, uh, you know, obviously follow the law and they view uh, the entire system as being just. Hope. All right. I, 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 uh, uh, I guess the next place to go with this, Mark, I mean, you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned Minnesota and, and obviously all of this started in Minneapolis, George Floyd, an African-American man, uh, was, uh, uh, was killed, um, allegedly by Derek Chauvin. I think we always say alleged killer before someone has actually been convicted. Um, although everything is on tape. And then now the other three officers who were there also responding have been charged uh, with aiding and abetting that situation. Um, you mentioned racial disparities in a lot of different areas. When it comes to actually the use of force and when it comes to how police departments tend to respond to people of color versus somebody that looks like you or me, what is the disparity there? What, what do we know about how the use of force differs by race? Well, there are uh, differences, although some of it depends on whether you're looking just at deadly force or um, any excessive use of force. Well, let's um, say both. I mean, why don't you break both down for us, excessive force and deadly force? Well, the latest research has shown that excessive force, there's more of a disparity, whereas deadly force, it's... Um, not entirely clear. You know, it depends how you how you kind of run the numbers. So, um, you know, one of the things we're also looking at, and perhaps it's a thought experiment to consider, is we all wish George Floyd would have survived that arrest, and therefore he would have been booked into jail. And you know, what are the other um, uh, disparities that he would have encountered in terms of, for example? We know George Floyd lost his job as a restaurant bouncer because of the, you know, shutdown of restaurants in Minnesota. Now, we could pretty much assume he was counterfeiting $20. He didn't have a lot of real money, if in fact it was counterfeit. Um, and, and I assume it was, but, we'll, you know, I guess that had been proven yet technically. But, you know, he didn't have a lot of money to bail out of jail. Let's face it, he didn't have a lot of money to hire a good lawyer. And time after time, any research you can see, 
if you're, you're kept in jail pre-trial, you lose your job if you still have one. You may be evicted from your apartment. Well, let's oh, okay. So let's 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 take yeah. that. You're 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 kind of weaving a, a hypothetical. So let's just go yeah, right yeah. back to the beginning, beginning and create uh, a hypothetical here. So let's just say you have two people. They're both 19 years of age. One black kid or brown kid, one white kid. All right, two young males, and they're both arrested for the same crime except the white kid is maybe from a middle class or an upper middle class family. And then the black kid statistically would be maybe from a, a slightly socioeconomically less advantageous position. So what is the process? What, where are the disparities in that process? Yeah. And so you start out with being able to get out of jail. I mean, and a number of jurisdictions still have bail schedules, which means for a certain offense, regardless of your criminal history or anything else, um, there's an X, uh, X amount, it's $10,000 or $20,000 to get out of jail. And if you have 10% of that, typically to pay a bail bondsman, and you can find a bail bondsman who will you know, work with you, you get out of jail. But if you don't, you stay in jail. For, and it often months, we have a big problem with speedy trials too. Now, what's really fascinating is, this came out in the Harris County bail litigation, the vast majority of these people in the misdemeanor cases, they ultimately got probation. So we administered the brunt of the punishment before they were ever convicted. It, it, it's intolerable. And if they simply had had more money, in some cases $500 bail, they would have gone home. Um, so that's the first place. And then if you ever, in terms of negotiating your plea, and of course you're at a huge disadvantage in the plea bargain discussion, if you're sitting in jail, you're desperate. They plead in time served, whatever the prosecutor says just to get out of jail. So, but also, of course, being able to pay for a good lawyer is incredibly correlated with what your outcomes are, whether you get a, a more serious sentence or not. Okay, so starting with the pretrial, you're saying that if you come from a less advantageous financial situation, obviously, and you can't make bail, you're stuck in jail for months. This is going to disproportionately impact people of color who are already disproportionately maybe being arrested for these crimes. And so then the white kids can bail out and go back and um, maybe they've lost their job, maybe they haven't, but if you're in jail for months pre-trial because there's not a lot of maybe movement in the system, I mean, you're certainly going to lose your job, right? Yeah, and the flip side of this is equally bad and that is people that are extremely dangerous that have a lot of money. There was actually a case last year in Texas. This was a, a child sex offender who was in, in, um, in jail. And his mom, won the, the jail, bond was set at a million or $2 million. I mean, this was a really dangerous person and a child predator. And his mom won the Texas lottery during that time frame, And then she came up and paid the million or $2 million. So we're, we're doing something based on somebody's wealth, not public safety. So that's the flip side, right? If you're really wealthy, you go home no matter how dangerous you are. So we got to change that, but, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the larger group by far is the people that languish in jail because they don't have money. Um, and while their cases, you know, like what- so, take so what do you do? So what do you do about that? I mean, if, if, if bail, cause I mean, clearly bail is an unfair system. It's just based on how much money a person has or their access to resources. If you are poorer, if you are a person of color, if you're in a indigent population, as the word that sometimes is used is, well, what if you're in an indigent population, you're just lower on the ladder socioeconomically, you can't make bail as easily as somebody from a more advantaged community. So bail is, is, would seem like it's the most unfair thing in the world. How do you replace that system with something more fair, Mark? Well, at a minimum, what you do is you say, if you are going to use money bail, it should be affordable. It should be something that person can pay without, by the way, having to use a commercial bail bondsman, although, you know, if they want to use it, that's fine. But, you know, it's basically, when you think about it, the commercial bail system, it's a requirement to buy insurance, which is what Obamacare was, the individual mandate, uh, frankly, because the whole theory of it is the bail bondsman is going to pay the whole amount to the county if you don't show up. Now, in reality, they get off of that through legal challenges, they rarely, and many some of them go bankrupt and the county never gets it. So, but the bigger issue, by the way, is very few people flee, very few people abscond. 
Now, people do miss court hearings, but they almost always show up at a subsequent court hearing. And I'll tell you something that's really interesting. Now, people do need to be denied bail if they're too dangerous. That's what we need to change in terms of the Texas Constitution, for example. It currently says in the Texas Constitution, you can be denied bail for capital murder, but not for murder. I mean, it's extremely limited. So the only option the judge has is to set a high bail and hope they can't, the person can't make it. But that's not what bail is supposed to be. So bail- a really... So, so right now it's the law in the state of Texas. And I, I would assume, is that the case for other states too? Same thing? Uh, well, every state varies, but, um, and there's- By and large, if you are rich, you get to pay bail and get out of really serious crimes. And if you are poor, even if you don't have a serious crime, you may have to languish in jail for months because you can't make the bail. Right, and in, in Texas in particular, and many other states, the judge, can't just deny bail, even after due process, for really serious people that are charged with murder and have really serious prior violent offenses. There are cases where, for public safety reasons, someone should be denied bail no matter how much money they have, and the judges cannot do that. So they try to set high bail and hope the person doesn't have the money. It really Um, goes both ways. It's not just just on the lower end people that can't afford to pay bail. It's the 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 situation where you do have a dangerous person, judges can't even, at least in Texas, can't even deny bail for most things, unless it's capital right. murder. But for regular old murder, which is still pretty bad, you can't deny bail, deny bail if you're a judge. You just set it right. right now. So and there's two. You know, we, we want to. We don't want people to abscond. We want them to come back so justice can be done. And we want to protect the risk that a small number of people might be rearrested for a really serious offense during the intervening time. Now, on the first one, this is really interesting. During this pandemic, a lot of courts have converted to virtual um, hearings. And so on the pretrial, during that pretrial period. Now, this is astounding. In Michigan and New Jersey, we've gotten the data and the failure to appear rates, they were 15% or 20%. Now they're 1% when people are going on Zoom or another method to show up pretrial. And that reflects the fact that the reason people weren't missing a hearing was not because they were absconding, getting on a plane to Europe. These are people with a lot of resources. They couldn't have childcare. They couldn't get time off work. Um, They forgot about it, which actually text reminders help a whole lot with that. But this, this appearance data, when people were doing the virtual hearings, almost everyone is showing up for those hearings. So that is astonishing. So, so moving, so as a kind of a byproduct of this pandemic, moving, appearances to virtual makes it easier for people to appear maybe who would have difficulty for whatever reason and obviously this would disproportionately impact lower socioeconomic strata folks but it makes it easier for people to appear and you said it went from like 20 percent to one percent yes it's amazing that's exactly right and transportation i mean that was a huge issue people getting to court who don't have a car and so forth they're their driver's license suspended because they couldn't pay a fine. There's lots of people that are in that, that boat. So um, what we're encouraging is, so because you did these things, necessity is the mother of invention. Don't just automatically revert to what you did before. Take a look and see if this might work better. All right. So I, I, I can't let you go on this bail issue though, Mark, because you just know every study, it seems like that's out there, you seem to maybe have in your head. So, I mean, is there not an alternative to bail that would replace it and maybe be fairer to people that just don't have any money. Right, now, again, if you say it all, it has to be an amount the person can afford now, and there are alternatives. There's even in the monetary, we don't need monetary necessarily, but if you're gonna have some financial condition that somebody um, signs something saying they'll pay the court, the county a certain amount, if they don't show up, that's unsecured uh, bail or also collateral that they can post something with the county. But, you know, you can also just do things like text reminders and pretrial supervision. Well, but hold on. Is there not a non-monetary or non-like material way to achieve the same thing that bail is trying to achieve of making sure that people come back? I mean, I understand that bail is there because you don't want people running away. And if you make them put up tons of money, they don't want to lose the money. So then they're going to come back and they're going to show up. At the same time, a lot of people that don't have the money, and maybe they don't even have a lot of collateral. I mean, what happens if a homeless person, you know, is arrested, and then you have these bail schedules? I mean, they're not going to have anything to put up, even as collateral. 
So, I mean, that's not, I don't think, a, a ridiculous scenario, is it, Mark? I mean, not at all. I mean, the, and you hit the nail on the head. It's the white collar people. They could hop a flight to Europe and leave their whole life behind. Who well, yeah. I mean, you had this guy from, uh, wasn't it the former chairman of Nissan who fled yeah. Japan and he ended up going to Lebanon? Um, and so, I mean, how do you, is there not a way other than bail, or maybe there's a, uh, a threshold where bail doesn't apply or something? Is there not some other theory on the table or policy on the table for that? Yes, absolutely. And it's an, the white collar individuals we're talking about, it's an infinitesimally small group, especially in state systems. So here's the thing. You know me, I don't like to cite Washington, D.C., but the Washington, D.C. system for many years has almost no use of financial conditions. And they have extraordinarily good results in terms of both public safety, not many people are rearrested, and very high rates of people. Okay, so Washington, D.C., District of Columbia. Yeah. What is their system? You're saying they've got a good system. Well, it's pre they do pretrial supervision. In other words, okay, you didn't pay anything, but we're going to keep an eye on you. You know, we're text reminders of court dates, but we're also for people in a high risk category. Risk assessment is very important to give, to use an assessment to see what are the risks that that person might pose, but also what are their needs? I mean, as you said, if they're homeless, if they're mentally ill, um, address those in the pretrial setting um, to make it less likely that they're either gonna be rearrested or fail to show up in court, and they do that. Um, so they provide that pretrial supervision and they have very low rates of people being rearrested re for serious offenses as well, or any of the offenses. So how do, uh, they, how do they provide, like, let's say a homeless person? How do you, how do you supervise a homeless person pretrial? Well, first in of all- DC, In Washington, D.C. Right, you would make an arrangement for them in terms of the shelter or other temporary housing. If, um, you know, of course, if they don't have a cell phone, text messaging will be difficult. Um, there are ways of donated and various programs for, for getting a phone. Um, so uh, obviously it's it's challenging, but you also have to consider what are, um, but one of the things you also do is you, you identify people that know that person. Maybe it's a minister. So you build kind of a circle, and this can be done even through different apps to keep track of who does that person know that's a credible, that's a trusted person in the community. So that that's very uh, effective as well. So, Mark, we've just described the pretrial period where, obviously, somebody with lower socioeconomic resources is going to be at a huge disadvantage. And so if you've got, you know, our example was young black teenager versus young white teenager, probably the, uh, the black kid is probably at a huge disadvantage, especially uh, with things like bail schedules and other things that require a certain financial investment for somebody to be able to just even not be stuck in jail for months. I mean, and, and of course, a homeless person or somebody like that also huge disadvantage. Um, and so then we go into the courtroom and let's assume that everybody is showing up, whatever they go into court. And then where's the disparity at that point? Yeah. And as we said, it's a, what the fix in the basic way is pretty simple. And in, in terms of saying, if you're going to use uh, money or financial conditions at all, first you decide whether someone should be released or not, as long as they're not uh, too dangerous to be released, uh, that they should be released, and then you determine what conditions th that are appropriate. So instead of making uh, bail a method of detention, it has to be a method of release to the extent it's used. So, um, but once we've addressed that, then actually we have to look at the indigent defense question, as you raised, and recognizing once somebody's out of jail pretrial, which again, you're presumed innocent in the United States, uh, it was Chief Justice William Rehnquist who said we should have a strong presumption uh, against detaining people pre-trial for that reason. Uh, but once you're out of jail, um, making sure that you have a quality lawyer as soon as possible um, is very important in terms of what the outcomes are and whether it's going to be um, just in actuality and a perception of justice. Okay, so let's talk about lawyers and getting lawyers. Obviously, um, in our example, white teenager, you know, let's call him, uh, let's call him Jeff. Uh, not Jess, let's call him Jeff, and say Jeff is from a middle class, upper middle class family, um, and Jeff's gone out and done something he shouldn't have done. He's probably, or his family, or someone close to him, uh, unless maybe he's in a rural area where white poverty is uh, very high. If he's in a suburban area, the likelihood is Jeff can afford a decent attorney. 
but you know, over here you've got the black teenager, uh, and uh, he's you know maybe you know let's let's call him you know Mark or Marcus. He can't he he can't afford a, a good attorney, Mark. So at what point does that start to really affect? I mean, how do you rectify that situation? Because if you've got people who are disproportionately being arrested and they're disproportionately then being locked up maybe in jail pre-trial, how in the world do they get a anything close to as good of an attorney as the person that has resources? Because then they're just what? They're, they're basically getting the public defender kind of thing. Right, or an appointed counsel, which in Texas to handle a misdemeanor case, $200 per case, very low um, rates. And of course, that gets back to the fact we have too many cases to begin with because we're arresting people and prosecuting for people. We shouldn't have to be um, subjecting to that. So that's part of it. The other thing is we need to look at how we uh, provide indigent defense. And there's a lot of new strategies that are showing a great deal of success. So um, holistic or participatory defense is one and also client choice. So let me explain those a little bit. Um, the holistic or participatory defense, the idea is that the defense lawyer is doing more than just dotting the I's and crossing the T's from a legal standpoint. So let me give you an example. Someone who's now a district attorney in Texas, but was a defense lawyer at the time, told me about this case. It was, a, it was a mother, a single mom, who was being prosecuted for drug possession. Now, again, we've talked about how speedy trials are a real problem in this country. It can take months or years to get a trial. So 99% of cases are handled by plea bargaining. So shortly after she got out of jail, this defense lawyer arranged for her through his contacts to get drug treatment. Now, fast forward several months later, this defense lawyer is sitting down with the prosecutor and the prosecutor is like, I still think we need to give, him, give her a felony conviction. Um, and this defense lawyer said, well, I've already solved the problem. She's clean. She's back at work. She's doing great with her kid. What's the felony conviction going to add for her? So this defense lawyer, and he eventually convinced the prosecutor of this after a lot of conversation. That's what it is. That, and there's Bronx Defenders, which is a great example of that. It's, it's the holistic thing, engaging service providers, not just, because most we all know most defendants actually are guilty, by the way. Alan Dershowitz has pointed this out, right? It's not that they're not guilty. Now, there are a lot of innocence cases. There's people in prison today who are innocent, which is a huge issue that we have to talk about how to address that. Um, and whether it's improving wits, uh, witness lineups or um, dealing with um, jailhouse informants who give false information, forensics. There's lots of things we need to do to address that. But the vast majority of people that are prosecuted, the police got it right. The prosecutor got it right. They're guilty. But in all this months before the case is resolved, that's the time when we most need to address their issues that cause them to get involved in the criminal justice system. And the defense lawyer can do that with a holistic approach. The other one is client choice, where the, um, and this has been piloted with great success, it's been evaluated in Commonwealth County, Texas, but this is saying instead of appointing you a lawyer by the government, by the judge, and by the way, we know judges have very busy dockets in many places. Some of them, they feel it's in their interest to have the defense lawyer who will do the least so they can move the docket, a plea machine. Um, and there's some places where the defense lawyer is appointed has hundreds of cases at the same time. There's no way they could figure Hold on. Thing. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. This is important. Yeah. You've just made a connection that people need to pause and consider. You've said that where the dockets are full, it is in the best interest, maybe of the judge, to have defense attorneys who will simply plea on behalf of the defendant. Is that right? That's correct. And of course, with the defendants that are in jail, they want to plea, by the way. They can't afford bail just to get out of jail and plead a time served. So that's part of it. But in Harris County, this goes back several years under previous district attorney, the uh, hundreds of people pled guilty to drug possession in this circumstance to time served in jail. And then it was discovered that the, there was a mistake that once the lab test came back a year or two later, the substance wasn't even a legal drug. So people plead to things they didn't do uh, as well. Well, uh, people plead to things they didn't do because they're stuck in jail. They don't have money to pay for the bail, Mark. Right. And they also don't have confidence they're going to be vigorously represented. Would you want to go to trial 
uh, and face being convicted because you have a crummy lawyer? So a public defender who is maybe knows the judge and they're there all the time. I mean, wouldn't it be the case? Now, I don't know that this is true. I'm asking you this question. But would a public defender who knows that judge be more likely to plea than a private attorney? Yeah, no, I, I don't think we know that. I think we know that those who have enormous caseloads, and of course, if you're being paid by the whole per case, which is the most common for appointed counsel, you have a monitor. I mean, to make a living when it's very little per case, you have to be pleading lots of cases and having a huge. And how much? And just, just, and I, I still want to ask you about Como County, but just so I can, I can flesh out this point with you. In let's just say Texas, because we're both in Texas. In Texas, if you're appointed counsel to represent a defendant who cannot afford an attorney, what does that person make for each case? Well, it varies by county, but uh, two hundred dollars well, for a misdemeanor is is common. Two hundred dollars for a misdemeanor. Right. And you know, there's lawyers in DC who get thousand dollars an hour. I mean, no, I was going to say $200 for a misdemeanor, but many lawyers get several hundred dollars per hour. Most lawyers perhaps at charge at least a couple hundred dollars per hour. And so really you're talking about a small amount of time that that attorney can really even afford to give a defendant. Well, back in the days when I was, did some legal work at the law firm I was at, a woman got appointed to a, a, a capital case, and it was $2,000 for the whole case. And this is a, a murder. Now, here's another one. $2,000 for a capital murder case? Yes. And if you want to get a, a, an expert witness or you want to get the forensics, the, the um, test run to make sure they got the right person, you, want, uh, you have to get the judge to approve that. The prosecutor's got endless deep pockets. He can spend as much money as he wants of our tax dollars, but the defense lawyer to um, get the expert witness to get the forensics analysis, that's all got to be approved by the government, by the judge who appoints these attorneys. So Comal County. The, the Comal County, by the way, just for people's clarification, yeah. is a county east of San Antonio, correct? Right, exactly. So they did a pilot program with the Texas Indigent Defense Commission where, and it's still going on, been very successful, the defendants can choose. Instead of having their lawyer appointed by the judge, they can choose from a qualified list of individuals and their caseloads are monitored by the county, very important. And you could think of it almost like Angie's list if you could see reviews of how other defendants thought that lawyer was. I mean, how valuable would, I mean, that's a market mechanism. I mean, we've talked about school choice, so why not have defendants be able to choose? Right, except in this case, you're talking about choice for people that normally wouldn't have a choice. Right, they get whoever the government or a judge assigns to them who has a motive. But in Comal County, Texas, they get a choice and they get to try and choose the attorney that they believe will best represent them. Yes, and I'll also tell you, I go, I think most judges do a great job and, and their motive is justice, but there is evidence also that judges appoint campaign contributors more likely to appoint them to um, represent people. So. Well, and if, and if judges appoint campaign, so, so there is evidence that judges are more likely to appoint campaign contributors, attorneys that give them money. And, and that is, I think, probably pretty common among attorneys to give money contributions to judges, isn't it? It is. And so then if they get that position, they get appointed by the judge, they can just, because they're, they're being paid a low amount per case, they have every incentive to shuffle those cases along. And since they have that relationship maybe with the judge, they just shuffle everything over to plea and those defendants never really get represented. Right, and they're getting a small amount per case. So to resolve the case quick, the most quickly possible is in their interest. You know, so, so let me ask you, why is what Comal County is doing giving a basic level of choice to people that otherwise cannot afford a decent attorney? Why is that? not the case everywhere. I mean, honestly, why is it that, that people are stuck with these attorneys who are just moving them through the system and pleading on their behalf and getting something on their record that's going to, in major ways, affect their life? Yeah, and by the way, we're, the other important part of this is uh, indigent defense in many states, including Texas, it's funded by fees. So, um, these the revenue is dried up due to the pandemic so just in texas in the last in in um, april the money coming into the indigent defense and then uh, 59 percent in may 
it's from I'm sorry I'm sorry Mark could you could you um could you restate what you just said because you cut out for a moment yeah so one of the problems in April you were saying that the the amount going for energy defense redu was reduced now now we don't know what the out the door effect is but the it, that hasn't come about just yet but a lot of states, including Texas, fund indigenous defense based on fees, including fees. Whether the civil justice system or like tickets in Texas. So speeding tickets, marijuana citations, and you know uh, fines when people have a conviction for misdemeanor marijuana. Now those have, were already going down even before the pandemic, but traffic ticket revenues really gone down now. So the um, the money's drying up actually. That's already funding indigent defense. So this uh, has also come up recently in Louisiana. So there's literally not the money to keep paying, whether it's public defenders or appointed counsel, again, even in a system that already was incredibly strained. So, so why is this not the case everywhere that people get more than just really poor defense in these, in these trials? Well, we talked about earlier how we ask police to do too much in some ways. And, you know, I think it's important, of course, to ask them to do things that put them in positive interactions with the public, whether it's, you know, uh, the type of, um, you know, doing things involving youth groups in a public housing project, which a study just came out in Los Angeles showed greatly reduced recidivism. But we're also asking the court system to do too much because um, there's this huge number of cases. I mean, there's there's cases that don't need to be in the justice system, things where somebody shouldn't have been um, uh, prosecuted to begin with, or it's something that should be a civil matter, um, uh, whether it's the drug area, mental illness, homelessness, that we should have been dealing with some of these things in, in, the, um, in the civil context. And of course, there are some examples, like in Massachusetts, they are doing um, civil commitment for people with you know, drug over an opioid overdose, right? The police find someone passed out on the ground with an opioid overdose. They don't take them to jail. They take them to a hospital. And it's as if they need to be civilly committed to treatment, like someone who's seriously mentally ill and about to kill themselves. Now, there's a very got to be a very high legal standard. We all believe in that um, for doing that. But when you put this into the jails, that's the worst case to treat mental illness. And so we're we're putting a lot of things into the courts and the jails that don't re shouldn't really be there. So when you have this massive number of cases that the resources are stretched. You know, Mark, we, we, I, I've been so focused on the racial aspect of this, but you mentioned something that we should probably just touch on, which is mental illness. What is the rate of mental illness that research points to among individuals that are incarcerated and then are later charged with crimes? Well, that's a great question. And I'm so glad you mentioned rural areas where this is a bigger share because there, in rural areas, by the way, there's a lot of counties where there are no defense lawyers. There's 11 counties in Nebraska where there's no defense lawyer. There's counties where there's no judge running a court every day. So that delays people in jail. You have a judge wide circuit who may show up in one county one day, another county another day, and so forth. So there's real, and of course, rural areas economically have, have been um, falling behind in recent years. So there's a lot of challenges there, and the opioid epidemic has obviously been front and center on that. But, you know, I, I, I really think um, that 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 all of this kind of shows that there there is um, this idea that we have to kind of make justice more available to everybody in all segments of our society, and that we have to design the justice system to account for people who are the most vulnerable and the me people that have mental illness are in that category. Now, to answer your question, about fifteen percent of people in prisons, for example, have serious mental illness. There's a larger percentage that have a, a, a more a moderate or mild mental illness, a huge percentage with traumatic brain injury. They looked at it in Colorado, um, ha as many as half uh, had some brain injury, degree of traumatic brain injury. Now this could come from, you know, you probably heard of veterans courts. There's people that served in our military and got a brain injury that way, but there's also people that got it through being abused as a child uh, and things that uh, falling, uh, being victims of crime themselves uh, that, uh, damage, that traumatize their head. So we have to use some assessment instruments to make sure that what we think is one thing isn't something else, or you know, you could have both a mental illness and a traumatic brain injury and a substance abuse disorder. So there's people with a lot of different vulnerabilities coming into the criminal justice system. And um, I think mental illness is something that really brings people together because so many Americans have a friend or family member who struggled with that. 
progress on things like crisis intervention uh, teams, training certain officers to um, respond to people with mental illness. We're also doing a lot in Texas on um, specialized probation and parole caseloads, where that officer has a smaller caseload, has training in mental illness, and how to interact with the MHMR, with the uh, mental health system, to make sure people are doing their appointments and so forth. So I'll tell you one story about Houston. They realized they got people, they call them frequent flyers, coming into the jail as many as 50 or 100 times in a year, one person showing up in jail for criminal trespass, for public urination, that one person counting for an unbelievable amount of resource being paid. So what they did is say, let's drive by that person's residence with a mental health case worker, and maybe also a sheriff's deputy needs to be there depending on the situation. But let's check on that person. Let's make sure they're taking their medication. And it was amazing. They eliminated so many of these um, uh, arrests and, and jail admissions for very minor conduct that these mentally ill, seriously mentally ill individuals were um, experiencing. Okay, Mark. So we've covered a lot about pretrial and then actually during defense and so forth. When it comes to sentencing, when it comes to actually how the sentences are handed down, the kinds of penalties, the kinds of uh, terms of jail sentences and things like this, what is the difference along racial and socioeconomic lines? Is there a difference? What, what's the breakdown of that? Well, yeah, obviously, for example, how effective your attorney is makes a big difference for the few cases that do. Well, go. that's true. I mean, let's, okay. F right. Well, that's, that's, that's true. So, I mean, we talked a lot about, that's true. So let's say you have, you know, black kid, white kid, 19 years of age. We've moved them through now. We're at sentencing. Okay. Assuming the same resources, let's say they both could afford or had the same exact attorney. Is it more likely that the black kid gets sentenced to a harsher sentence than the white kid? Well, there is research from the Federal Sentencing Commission that blacks for the same drug offense with the same uh, history uh, in terms of offense history and same risk profile have 20% longer sentences. That is true. 20% longer sentences. That's correct. And, you know, honestly, there's, it's hard. There's so many different things that could influence. I mean, most sentences are from judges. Some... In Texas, we also, the defendant can choose jury sentencing. But there was this study just out of Louisiana that in the weeks after LSU lost in football, the judges imposed more serious offense, uh, serious longer sentences. I'm not surprised at that. Louisiana is, uh, LSU football is a big deal. Yes, and likewise in Pennsylvania, which has partisan judicial elections like Texas, as the election date approached judges in cases where everything else was similar, they began to impose longer sentences. So, yes, there's a lot of reasons for potential disparities. But um, the other thing that's really important is once you're actually on probation or in prison, if you're on probation, you have fees. And if you don't pay those, you can be revoked to prison. So how much money you have makes a difference. Um, obviously, how you interact with the probation officer makes a difference. If you are incarcerated, do you have money for phone calls? So there's the, 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 the disparities kind of continue, basically. Hold on. We're going to come back to that. I want to yeah. just ask you, on judicial disparities. Is there anything in judicial reform that you feel like is important? You mentioned as, as election dates get closer, everybody wants to sentence everyone to a longer sentence or whatever. So, I mean, and after LSU loses the game, if you're in Louisiana, it's a bad time to be sentenced for a crime. What, what judicial reforms maybe would be appropriate or are there any in your view? Mark Levin. And also there's some research right before lunch when the judge is hungry is a bad time as well. But, and again, I don't want to, you know, insult. I mean, we have by and large excellent judges who, you know, I think have a uh, intent to do justice, right? But there are these other, there are factors that, um, you know, can get in the way. Okay. Um, but other than making sure that they're well fed, that their football <laughs> team wins every game and that they are guaranteed to win the election. What other things are appropriate to make sure that judges are fair in sentencing, Mark Levin? Well, that's a good point. I'll tell you, I would say, um, what I would say would be trauma-informed sentencing. And that means um, that, again, we've determined the person's guilty, but let's let the jury, um, let's let them consider, let's say they should consider in the statutes that 
was the person, did they have exposure to violence? Did they, were they a victim of human trafficking? Of course, maybe they shouldn't have ever been prosecuted in that case, but, you know, Governor Abbott signed um, an edict uh, earlier this year, which we certainly uh, urged, was to say that uh, people in prison who were victims of human trafficking or domestic violence, he created an, a, a clemency review process, especially for them. Now, again, this gets back to what we talked about earlier. Somebody, we're at sentencing now, they might have been victims of crime. They may have been exposed to terrible violence. They might have joined a gang because they were for fearing of their own life. Now, none of that excuses the crime. I mean, I believe I'm, I believe people ought to be held accountable. Um, but in terms of the sentence, how many years someone might go to prison for, whether they should go to prison or get probation, absolutely. That level of culpability. And then for young people, I mean, the mind is still, uh, I, I recently did a paper on um, emerging adults. Um, you know, 18, 19 year olds. And it's a huge share of, of the people. It's about a quarter of those um, in the, on probation and, and being convicted. But they're, they're not children under the law, but they are still maturing. And the, the jury should also be able to take that into account as well, or the judge who's ever doing the sentencing. So you're saying that maybe by allowing for juries and judges to consider different issues, that's one way to potentially ensure more fairness in sentencing. Absolutely. And the prosecutor, they always, they already do. They tell them all the bad things about the person. And that's, you know, look, that's fair is fair. But there should be in our statutes, I think, guidance for judges and juries to consider all of these mitigating factors as well. Okay. And so now let's say somebody's been sentenced and they're in jail or they're on probation. And you started to mention that even there, there is a financial consideration that comes into play. Explain where that disparity comes in, Mark Levin. Sure, well, if you're put on probation, one condition is having a job. And of course, that's more challenging these days with the pandemic. Um, but in Texas, for example, your probation fees are about $60 a month, which doesn't sound like much to you and I. But by the way, a lot of these people, there's court fees, there's fines for the offense. You know, in Texas, um, the felony of possessing less than a gram of drugs, the, the fine is up to $10,000 for that particular offense. Now, anecdotally, we don't think most courts go that way, but you can. But if you don't pay these probation fees and you don't have a job, when perhaps the probation officer thinks maybe you could have gotten one, technically speaking, in a lot of places, that means you could be revoked to prison. Now, in fairness, Usually it's multiple violations. It's you missed an appointment with a probation officer and you're not paying your fees, right? But I'll tell you something really interesting. We've seen the research, and this is even in interviews with probation officers, a lot of the reason they miss an appointment is because they don't have the money to pay the fee, that the money that they're supposed to bring with them. And in Texas, we finally passed a law several sessions ago. It said you can't be revoked only for not paying. It has to be with another violation. So in about half the motions to revoke someone's probation, being behind on your uh, probation fees is one of the reasons. But these probation, people on probation, a lot of them don't even know that. So they don't show up to their appointment because they don't have their money, which is the worst thing they could do, right? They, they should go and explain it all. So it's, um, it, it certainly is difficult um, when, uh, you know, harder to navigate these systems when you have fewer resources. Well, and, and people, who have fewer resources just so happen to be more often black or brown people of color they have fewer resources mark so it i mean when people are saying and, and i should remind anyone listening to or viewing this you are a conservative at a right wing think tank and you're saying all of this stuff which I think it's its own, I'll probably ask you about that in a moment, but I think that's interesting too, because I think that points to the fact that this maybe isn't even really as much of a partisan issue as it's just, maybe it's common sense. Because just the fact is, if you have lower resources, the system is going to, in general, point you towards worse outcomes. Is and that I think I can Yeah, and I can explain that in the sense that um, we all believe in capitalism. If you're very successful, you can buy a nicer car, a nicer home. But the backdrop to what we're talking about is the a government imposition of government power on people. Uh, and that the scales of justice, we have to take into account the condition in which people come to the system, whether it's because they're mentally ill or they're poor. 
And because it's the government, we're exercising government power over people. We're not talking about a free market where people are choosing to get a nicer car or a nicer home. So that's why as conservatives, um, we can say, yes, we need to even those scales of justice. Um, that, well, some, well, some conservatives, I mean, also to be fair, you're one conservative that says, yes, criminal justice reform is important. And you're saying all these things and you're citing the research. However, um, I think in general, it seems like the tough on crime crowd tends to be more of a Republican crowd more of a conservative crowd uh, than people on the left and Democrats these days. Is that fair to say? Well, I think we've made a lot of changes on that. I mean, I, and I think it gets down to kind of once people understand that just, um, obviously there's people that need to be punished. We all understand that. But, um, you know, for people like you and I, Jess, the fact that we could go to prison or jail, I mean, that's a huge deterrent. I mean, for, for me, but if, if, if for somebody who's homeless, their life, it, it's not that great right now, right? And the other thing is most criminal activity is impulsive. They're not reading the statutes to see what's against the law, what the potential punishment would be. So uh, w just punishing people without addressing the underlying causes of their criminal activity, it doesn't actually produce very good results. So we're not asking people to do something just out of a bleeding heart. We're asking them to do something because this is going to make us actually safer. And yeah, also easier for people to be employed and be productive in our society. I mean, we didn't even talk about the fact that you've got to have a car to get to your probation. Right. right? To, to meet it. Right. To meet Getting somebody. a car. Well, yeah. and I would assume that the Zoom, the virtual meetings also affects probation too, probably. Exactly. And so we've actually seen a lot of, um, virtually every state has, since the pandemic started, put that in place. And everything I know, I drug court judges tell me that are doing this, that they're getting much candor from their individual through the virtual hearing and they're seeing their family in the background which they find to be incredibly um uh, revealing and um that that they, it helps them the judge better understand what factors what the conditions are in that person and what make make it more or less likely they're going to what kind of help they need and so um again i'm not saying that we we, we certainly need to go back to some in-person interactions but there's tremendous opportunity that we've discovered through this. Well, even with the virtual thing, I mean, if somebody doesn't have a computer with a webcam or something like that, there's a potential disparity there too. I mean, obviously a homeless person can't do Zoom, you know, probably not. I, I, Mark, what I'm asking about with the political thing is really this question, just based on everything you've laid out here, okay? And you, you happen to be a conservative, and it seems like more conservatives are trying to be tough on crime than people on the left, but that may or may not be fair, I don't know. But as far as this issue goes, the facts as you've laid them out, and you just answered this question in the affirmative, if you have less resources, you're gonna have worse outcomes. In this nation, for various reasons, people of color have less resources. So they're gonna have worse outcomes. That's one reason among many but that's one reason that you would think could be addressed. Okay, so why isn't every politician on board with criminal justice reform and with trying to decouple resources from outcomes? Well, uh, I, I think we're making a lot of headway. Um, you know, I think it's about, um, you know, being able to, um, get their ear. I mean, and look, we all, both of us, and I think the vast majority of Americans, you hate to see any property damaged. I mean, that police officer in St. Louis who was killed, I mean, it just breaks your heart. And so um, we all wish that this issue, that there was uh, different circumstances under which so many people have um, uh, put this to the front burner, frankly, so many policymakers. I mean, we're seeing legislators, governors across the country say, please give me ideas. I, I really, you know, I, I got elected to office as a businessman. My main issue was cutting taxes and reducing regulations. But you know, now I realize we've got a real problem here and give me the solution. So um, I really believe we can turn this moment into something positive um, when it comes to, um, as you said, people of every ideology saying, I want a system that makes us safer, that's fair to everybody. Um, you know, 
one of the issues on risk assessment, which is something we support, that's looking at somebody, um, different factors. Do they have a previous uh, violent conviction? Do they um, have a previous time where they absconded, you know, when they were uh, awaiting trial, right? But one of the interesting things we found in that is um, a lot of the risk assessments said, well, did you have a previous drug possession conviction? And we already talked about that is going to have a, a disparate racial impact. It just will. And it doesn't relate to the, what we want to do is make sure that if we release you pretrial, you're not going to hurt somebody. So let's take that out of the mix. Let's just say, did you have a prior offense that hurt somebody? And, and that's those, those, those subtle changes in how we, you know, rate somebody's risk and make these decisions on whether who gets out of jail or not to say, we're going to account for those disparities. It makes a big difference. Mark, what got you interested in this in the very first place? We didn't cover that when we talked about your bio, but what, what sparked this interest? Obviously, you know a lot about this issue. So what, what originally sparked this interest? Well, there's a lot of ways I can answer that. Um, Were you arrested on a minor drug offense at some point in your life? I don't think so. No, not that, but I was, I was very disruptive in class, in elementary school in particular, and I I blurted out the answers before giving other kids a chance, which was not the right thing to do. And I got sent to the principal's office a lot for that. And one of the things that happened to me is I got a lot of corporal punishment. I got black and blue. And I also had to sit on a board on my knees for in, a, in the assistant principal's office, you know, hour or two, just on your knees, not being able to put your butt on the floor. And I think that what it did is it gave me a skepticism of authority, a skepticism of and of course, that can translate into a skepticism of government action, which is really a lot of what we're talking about here is, you know, conservatives think the post office does a lousy job. The welfare system does a lousy job. Why would we say, let's not apply the same lens of accountability to the criminal justice system? This is not, I mean, having to pay too much taxes really stinks, but having your liberty taken away, now that, that's a whole something else. And so I think it's that skepticism of authority of government power that drives a lot of this. And that's why conservatives, so many are coming to this issue. Well, let's go back to people that are not as skeptical about government power as you, Mark. And I want to ask directly about it. Tell me about the role of police officer unions, because it seems that when these issues come before state legislatures and perhaps in the federal government as well, that one of the repeated opposing forces to criminal justice reform are police unions and similar organizations that say, oh, no, 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 you can't have this. It's the end of the world. Tell us about a little bit about where that kind of factors in. Yeah, and I think we should talk about the police officer unions and also prosecutor associations. Prosecutor associations. Basically, yeah. everyone who's on the side that maybe, I guess, theoretically, would stand to lose something if criminal justice reform happened. Is it fair to say that? Let's talk about those people. Why, why do they oppose criminal justice reform? What's the effect of that opposition? And I'll start by saying they don't always, and they're not even always on the same side. In Texas last session, there was a bill that passed the Senate, didn't pass the House, but it said police officers have to share exculpatory information, the information that tends to show the person's innocent, but they have to share that with prosecutors. Now, it may not surprise you to know Police unions supported that bill. Prose uh, no, prosecutors supported that bill. Police unions opposed it and killed it. Um, now, we passed the Michael Morgan Act several years ago in Texas. Prosecutors have to share exculpatory information if they have it with the defense. And, but if right. the police don't share it with the prosecutors, then the prosecutors don't have it. Yeah, but usually prosecutors, police are on the same side or whatever. Yes. You might say people that stand to benefit in some way from having you know, a system that kind of runs like it has run, let's say. So, I yeah. mean, you know, uh, people do not want to be held more accountable, maybe, if they're in power. So why do, what's the effect of all that opposition to criminal justice reform? Well, most visibly now, we've seen with regard, obviously, and the academic studies back this up, the prosecutor unions have made it very, and police unions have made it very difficult to remove officers, even after it's been determined they have serious and even a pattern of misconduct over many years. There's various provisions in these contracts with these police unions that say you can't even question an officer for many days 
until after the incident, which no average citizen would have that protection. Um, so it's, it really has to be addressed. And of that course- That is so relevant because Derek Chauvin was repeatedly, uh, apparently uh, cited internally for having gone over the line in terms of how he dealt with various cases, correct, in Minneapolis? Yes, that's correct. And, um, you know, the, the police, uh, the public, the police, and again, I, I think people have the right to join a union and we have to separate private sector from public sector. Well, this isn't about unions. We're talking yeah, about no. interest groups and how it affects the policy process. So, so right. and the police unions, going. they give a lot of money in elections and politicians want to have that badge that said the police officers union in particular, they want to have that emblem on their mail piece that say they got that endorsement because they think the public confuses that with public safety. But these unions aren't even doing a good job representing the rank and file. Curry Myers, who's a career sheriff, uh, does our policing work with Randy Peterson. But Curry's paper that we, we put out, but it talks about how the police unions, it's top heavy. It's not the rank and file that set the agenda. And even in Texas, you know, they killed the bill we talked about earlier involving Sandra Bland. The police unions killed the bill that would have said you can't be uh, taken to jail for a fine only traffic offense, like a broken tail light, unless there's uh, imminent danger or breach of the peace. And the, uh, I looked at the Facebook page for the police union that killed that bill. And there were officers posting that said, you know what, I think maybe we're wrong on this. And I think if we keep doing this, we're gonna lose our legitimacy. We're gonna lose our pull, our clout. We have all this clout now, and maybe we're just going a little too far. But the leadership said of the union, we're not even negotiating. The last day of the session, even after it was too late to do anything, both Democrat and Republican legislators wanted to meet with that police union, and the police union would not meet with those legislators. This was May of 2019, before the pandemic. Um, so, I mean, that tells you a lot. I don't know of no other lobbying group that would not at least sit down with legislators to try well, to work. Sure, I mean, and then and, and, and to be clear, too, I mean, obviously, it would be the case that there'd be a diversity of opinion among police officers and um, police officers uh, would not all be super involved at the top of the police unions. But at the top of the police unions, what it sounds like, Mark, is that the foot is on the gas against reform, that that's a pretty consistent position. You mentioned academic research. What other academic research exists about police unions and their influence on the policy process for criminal justice reform? Yeah, no, it's very um, significant. In fact, there's a Republican district attorney in California who quit the um, a statewide prosecutors association because she didn't agree with their agenda. And by the way, a lot of the lobbying that they do, this is in Texas as well, it's using forfeiture, as civil asset forfeiture money. This is where people's property is taken without a conviction. Um, they're using that money to do lobbying. What? Um, you, wait a minute. Civil asset forfeiture, for people that don't know, is when property, well, explain what civil asset forfeiture is first, briefly. Yeah. And by the way, this woman, to answer your question, this district attorney in California, Republican, who quit the association, the police union just scorched her for sure. But you should an officer of shooting. Hold so, on. I want to, but I want to expound on this. Yeah. First, briefly explain what is civil asset forfeiture for people that do not know. Right. So this is where, if you're pulled over, uh, for speeding, let's say, and the officer sees money in your car, he can just take that money. And he can also take your car, by the way, too. Um, but um, then you have to prove, the burden on proof is on you to prove that the proceeds, the money, the property, to prove that that is unconnected to any criminal activity. You have to bring a civil lawsuit to get your stuff back. So if you've got, you know, let's say you're just, I don't know, I mean, a, an example being here in Houston, but this isn't necessarily just applicable to Houston. But let's say somebody went and drove a couple hours to the east. They went to Lake Charles, Louisiana, where there are casinos that many people in this area like to go to, and they won a few thousand bucks. You know, they were they had that rare winning night of playing blackjack or something, and then they've got cash in their car, and they're driving, and then they get uh, uh, pulled over for a broken tail light, and the officer's having a bad day and decides to put them in jail, and then the cash gets seized. That's civil asset forfeiture. Yes, and uh, pursuant to our earlier discussion, it might surprise you, might not surprise you to know this has also a disproportionate impact on particularly poor people and people of color. Because oh, I assumed that, of course. I mean, because they're yeah. getting pulled over more anyway. And they can't afford to hire a lawyer to get their stuff back. Now, this goes to the reforms. So you actually see cases styled 
you know, 1999 Chevrolet versus the state of Texas or state of Texas versus a 2001, you know, Ford, right? The car is worth less than it would uh, cost to hire a lawyer to try to file a civil suit to get the property back. So, I mean, we, is there we, a particular make and model of car that defends itself better in civil asset forfeiture cases, Mark? Yeah, exactly. It's a phantom. It's really a criminal punitive proceeding dressed up as a civil thing. So, I mean, this whole thing is extraordinary. But then what really is extraordinary to me is what the statement you made right before I asked you this, because I wanted to bring this out. You said prosecutors associations are using money seized in civil asset forfeiture to lobby against criminal justice reform. That's exactly right here in Texas and in other states as well. That's how they pay for their. How, how many other states? How, how widespread is that? Well, I think you just designed a research paper for TPPF to do. Uh, as we yeah, do. you need to look into that. I mean, seriously, how, how uh, that, that sounds like, I mean, that is just the, it, it's, it sounds like a system that could be misused, let's say. I mean, right. And now to be clear, it's not taxpayer money, but it's public money. Well, it's not taxpayer money, perhaps, but I mean, in a sense, it is. If a person gets pulled over and some stuff gets taken out of their car, and, you know, we've just described earlier, you said 15% of the Texas population is black, 50% of the people pulled over are black. So it's more likely going to affect people who are black. It just so happens. And then if they've got stuff in their car, and it also happens, I mean, I'm just pointing out the facts here, Mark. It happens that people who are lower income happen to less be less likely to be in the banking system, which means they're more likely to have their assets in terms of cash or physical possessions. Isn't that true? Yes, no, it's, it is true. So they're more likely to be affected by civil asset forfeiture. And then not only that issue, but then for that, that money to be used to lobby against reform of these laws it just seems it's that is an extraordinary thing that you're t you're saying. Yes, and it's also been used for margarita machines for parties and um, margarita uh, machines. That right. That we passed a law in Texas. Not every state has done this, but Texas has passed a transparency law um, and said you can't use it for those things. It has to be for real law enforcement expenses. Well, wait a minute. When was civil asset forfeiture used for margarita machines? Where was that? In Texas, before we passed that law. That was used in in Texas. So prosecutors Absolutely. bought margarita machines with money seized from people pulled over, whether it was for a, 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 and this, I'm assuming, you know, civil asset forfeiture, it sounds like it doesn't matter if the person ends up getting convicted of the crime or not. Right. The burden of proof is on the individual to bring a civil lawsuit to demonstrate that the property had no uh, relationship to any criminal activity, even if they were exonerated, even if a jury uh, found them not guilty. Um, they still don't automatically get their stuff back. They have to bring this civil proceeding. Who could possibly support that? Well, half the funds go to the police and half to prosecutors. So they have a- So the police and the prosecutors are the ones that are preventing this from being changed. That's correct. And just basic. So for example, in Texas, we had a bill last session that would have raised the, the evidence standard from a mere preponderance of the evidence, which is 50, you know, coin flip, 51%, to clearing, you have to prove with clear and convincing evidence that the property was um, uh, connected to criminal activity and that they posed that. Um, and again, short of getting rid of civil asset forfeiture, which I think we should do, except for, you know, uh, defendants that are outside of the jurisdiction, like a cartel in Mexico, right? but our unclaimed property, but short of that, we should get rid of it. But even if we didn't get rid of it, if the person's exonerated or if there's no conviction within some period of time, whether it's six months, a year, two years, whatever it should be, the odd property has to be automatically returned to the person. And, and one other thing, we're talking about forfeiture. We're not talking about seizure. Police well, you're, can, saying, you're saying automatically returned is the reform that you want, but that's right. not the law now. The law now is a person, their, their stuff gets seized and then, the burden of proof is on them basically to prove a negative that they didn't do something wrong to get the money. And to file a civil suit, to hire a lawyer and do that. So, so many cases, the government keeps it by default because the person doesn't have so, the resources. So you may not know how many states prosecutors are lobbying with this money, but how many states have some version of civil asset forfeiture? Most states, but in the last, um, I guess I would say seven or eight years, um, a pretty large number, like New Mexico, for example, have gotten rid of civil asset forfeiture. So 
there has been a groundswell on this. Um, but um, again, we're talking about when title, forfeiture is title of the property passing to the government from a person. Now seizure, you, you can take it initially, that's one thing, but it should not uh, pass to the government, the title to that property uh, without a uh, conviction. Again, unless you're talking about an international cartel or something that's based in that, you know, another country that you, you could never convict them. So um, it just seems so obvious. It, it Well, it, it seems, I mean, look, it seems like the facts clearly show that this disproportionately affects people of color, people who are lower income, and that this is, is part of a system that is why many, many, many people around the world, not just in America, are protesting uh, what they see as disparities in the criminal justice system. And let's be clear, I don't think it's unfair or wrong journalism to say the facts bear out the system is disparate outcomes. It's clear that there are disparate outcomes. And so why is it even legal or where is the justification or where is the policy reform, whatever, for there to be so much lobbying, so much influence, so much money coming from these public entities, public employees towards legislatures to, to continue a system that has such disparate outcomes, Mark Levin? Well, you're absolutely right. And one thing is the U.S. is fairly unique in this regard. I mean, you know, I had a chance to tour prisons in Germany, which were completely different. They have 10 percent of our incarceration rate. But the other thing was that, you know, it was it, 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 the, the people, it's not an elected individuals that are district attorneys. Right. Um, and, and I'm not saying how we should change that or not. But the reality was there were not um, there's not associations or unions of uh, these groups that are influencing the policy and the way it happens here. So we have, um, you know, a system that is very much politicized, that a system in which these interest groups, um, because of the resources uh, that they're able to bring to elections, local elections, uh, the various unions, and then um, obviously the state systems with these associations, um, they're able to have a, a, a influence and they, look, their perspective is valid. Legislators should meet with prosecutors and police officers and take into account their views. But the idea that they uh, should be able to um, uh, dictate uh, our criminal justice policy, that's wrong. Well, Mark, where does, I, I think I'm going to have to have you back for another interview at some point about other issues, including the pandemic, uh, which we have not discussed, but I know um, I know that is something that I think you've written on, and we'll probably just have to do another interview about that, frankly, because, uh, but, but tell me for, for all of these issues, I mean, you've, you've shown without a doubt that there's a disparity in the criminal justice system, disproportionately affects people who the protesters now are out there saying, yes, this is happening, and, and you're saying the facts really do bear it out. So where does America go from here? If policymakers were listening to this interview or watching this and they were saying, well, okay, so let's start doing something. I mean, where, where do, what's the next steps for them? Well, actually, let me ask you this and then you can answer that question. One such suggestion that has been made by many people who are out protesting is to completely disband police departments. And in fact, right before we started this interview, the news came out. I'm just going to read part of a story from NBC News. This is the lead of the story. A majority of the Minneapolis City Council agreed Sunday to dismantle the city's police department after the in-custody killing of George Floyd, a council member said. In an interview with NBC News, Councilman Jeremiah Ellison said the council would work to disband the department in its, quote, current iteration. And then another, uh, let's see, council president Lisa Bender called the city's relationship with the department toxic and vowed to recreate systems of public safety that actually keep us safe, quote. And she said, quote, our efforts at incremental reform have failed, period, quote, she said. Quote, our commitment is to do what's necessary to keep every single member of our community safe and to tell the truth that Minneapolis police are not doing that, end quote. 
and then goes on to say that as many as nine of the council have, have agreed to this, which is in, in Minneapolis, that's a veto-proof majority, Mark. So um, it sounds like there is a, a move here to some kind of community-based system or public safety system without a police department. I mean, that seems like a, a far move from, from the current situation, um, I guess, and then what would you do with the laws that are in place, et cetera? Who's going to determine it? I mean, that just opens up a whole can of questions. But I mean, what do you think about this proposal to disband the police department in Minneapolis? Came out just before we started the interview. No, that's a wrong approach, obviously. And, and let me tell you, what we need to do is focusing on restoring the legitimacy of police and our laws in the eyes of the entire population. I think that, um, you know, if, by the way, if you look on international comparisons, we have far fewer police per capita than France or Spain. Now, we have we need to have the right kind of policing. We need to look at how do we... We have fewer police than countries that maybe don't have as high an incarceration rate. Yes, we have way more people in prison, way more people on probation and parole, but way fewer police per capita than most European countries. So it's quite staggering when you look at it. And police can play a role in deterring crime. Um, now, the other problem with this proposal is if you, if you defund the police or whatever, cut their budgets dramatically, all they're going to be doing is responding to calls, which by definition puts them in a confrontational setting. Now, what's shown a great deal of promise is uh, putting police in more settings where they have positive interactions to build trust with the community. Now, some people say, let's just move that work out of the police department. But I think it's more effective in the police department because the officer has that relationship. So let me give you an example. The Credible Messengers, the work in Chicago where they have higher, by the way, murders are way down in Chicago. I know it's still totally unacceptable, but they're down 40% over the last year. But you have these credible messengers, which would be a former gang member, for example, someone who might have served time in prison and is now, you know, a minister or, you know, is upstanding in the community. They've overcome all that. Now, they go with the police officer, perhaps, and talk to some of the people who, by the way, there happens to be video of them doing certain things that, well, maybe they, um, we know they're in a gang, right? We don't necessarily have something right now to prosecute them on, but we know that, and by the way, we have through the data, we can show the likelihood that certain people are going to be shot is certain young black men in certain areas, their chance of shooting someone or being shot is off the charts in, in the next year, just by running certain factors. So um, having uh, those types of positive interactions by police accompanied by someone who particularly has credibility in that area, that builds those relationships and it causes people to see police in a positive light as I want to join forces with the police to protect my community. Forget the thin blue line. We're all we're in all this. We're all in this together, to to protect our community. And so that type of policing, it does cost money. It costs money to improve training of police. All these things we're talking about to do de-escalation techniques. So I I just think it's tragic that we've started with the notion of defunding the police. Obviously, we all want to find efficiencies. Look, there's Texas cities where one of the the highest numbers of calls is for um, a barking dog. I mean, we could send somebody who's a civil a service person, whether they work for the police department or not, we could send somebody who has, you know, a lower cost associated with them out to resolve that. And then if they need to call a policeman, they can do that. So there are things that-, that That's that, the most common call in Texas is a barking dog? It, it, there's some some cities I've seen in Texas where it's high on the list. It, it really, I'm, sure, I'm sure there in Austin, it's probably like what? Crowing chicken or something like that? <laughs> the different- or, or, or crazy loud punk music or something, but punk music. Well, yes, all has more punk yeah. music than country. But look, music. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, we 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 don't want to go to a um, society of you know dueling private protection forces and or where might makes right. Uh, you know, we do need the right kind of policing, and um, that does cost money. Um, and so um, it's and it. it Again, the positive stuff will be the first stuff to go because we got to have, when you call 911, you got to have somebody come out there. And um, uh, the response times are really important to preventing things from getting worse, like domestic violence, right? So uh, it's, it's really unfortunate that that is where some people want to take this. Well, Mark, I'm, I'm going to have to have you back on to explain more about some of these things because um, obviously you're a again, a conservative with a, a right wing or a conservative organization, Texas Public Policy Foundation, right on crime. 
which is a national effort, I think, not just in Texas. But uh, still, um, uh, probably maybe even at some point have you back on with one of your uh, left wing or liberal counterparts, because I know you, you do work, I think, with a number of people on the left. I, I guess probably as we wrap this up, explain a little bit about the bipartisanship aspect of this, because it is unusual for many people to hear some of what you're saying and then to know that you are somebody on the right as a conservative. When um, you mentioned Jeff Sessions and others, maybe that would people would just kind of stereotypically say, well, if you're a conservative Republican, it's Joe Arpaio, it's Jeff Sessions, it's tough on crime, it's, you know, um, what did Joe Arpaio do? He had the, the sweat camps and things like that. I mean, but in fact, there are people like yourself who are saying, no, let's reform it. And it goes back and then even President Trump obviously signed this law. So where is the bipartisanship aspect of it? And how do you see that playing in this issue going forward? And then solving this racial injustice issue that's been dominating the headlines the last couple of weeks? Yeah, well, um, I really think all Americans want right, both peace and justice. Um, justice takes time to deliver, whether it's an ind individual setting or enacting just policy. So, you know, we've seen you can start a fire right in a building that takes a second, but it, it's going to take us time uh, and deliberation to address these issues. You know, I think that, um, but I, but I, I know people that are out, you know, peacefully protesting. And that, that isn't a great American tradition. Obviously, destroying things isn't. Um, but I do think that we have a unique opportunity now. Um, and I think that there's a reason why this has all come about, the bipartisanship in criminal justice. And that's because at, at the root of this, we're saying, who doesn't want a safer society? Who doesn't want a lower recidivism rate? Who doesn't want more people with a criminal record holding a job and being able to take care of their family? Most people have religious beliefs that teach them about redemption, whether you're Christian or Muslim. Um, so it, there's so much that does unite us. And I also think from the policymakers we deal with at the legislature and Congress, we always hear about Republicans and Democrats, you know, can't get along, right? But the reality is, if you talk to them personally, they have friendships across the aisle and they see this issue as this is a chance for, not for me as a conservative, to say, I'm going to do this in spite of my principles. This is a chance for me to say, I'm going to do this because of my principles. Mike Lee says, it's because I'm a conservative, because I believe in limited government and unlimited opportunity. Um, but, you know, because I believe in giving people uh, a chance to be successful, um, that I'm working on criminal justice reform. Um, so it's a chance to do something to work with the other side, not to compromise our principles, but to deliver on them. And I think that the public is going to reward policymakers who come together to deliver both peace and justice. Well, Mark Levin, as we wrap this up, is there anything else that you want to say to anybody that's listening to or watching this interview? Well, I just want to thank you. You know, you have tremendous um, insight into, you know, a whole range of public policies. But as someone who hasn't spent the last 15 years like I've had 24-7, uh, dealing with this, you have um, tremendous knowledge and um, appreciation for the challenges we're facing and well, what some of the solutions are. So thank that's you. kind of you, Mark, but I think anybody that listens to the facts you've, you've set out, I mean, again, I'm not trying to espouse everything about my opinion with this issue. I, I just, it's clear the facts point a certain way and all these people are protesting and they feel that there's issues with this and it seems obvious that there are issues with the system. Now, what those issues are, how to solve them, yes, these are questions that, that continue. Maybe at some point I'll get somebody who's from one of these associations to be on with you and we can have a bit of a discussion. Uh, I don't want a, a big name calling fest, although I don't think that that's necessarily what it would devolve into. Um, but I appreciate, appreciate the compliment. Um, but thank you, Mark Levin, uh, Chief of Innovation and Policy at uh, right on Crime, a project of the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and uh, where he's been for the last 15 years. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And that was Mark Levin, the Chief of Policy and Innovation at the Right on Crime Initiative at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Remember, if you like the show, please subscribe 
on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app. Recently, we passed well over 100 subscribers on YouTube. I think we're at 120 something now, and we have a lot more listeners than that on the podcast. So thank you for your support of the show and for spreading the word. If you have an idea for a guest, please send me an email at jessfieldshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.